Good morning, Berkeley! Good morning. My name is Sunny Lee. My pronouns are she and her, and I have the honor to serve as the Associate Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs and Dean of Students, and I'm delighted to be your MC today. On behalf of the University of California, Office of the Chancellor, and the Californians Class of 2023, we are honored to welcome you to the 2023 commencement ceremony in the historic California Memorial Stadium. Before we begin this event, we take a moment to recognize that UC Berkeley sits on the territory of Huchun, the ancestral and unceded land of the Chichenyo speaking Ohlone people, the successors of the sovereign Verona Band of Alameda County. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Muwekma Ohlone tribe and other familial descendants of the Verona Band. We recognize that every member of the Berkeley community has benefited and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since the institution's founding in 1868. Consistent with our values of community inclusion and diversity, we have a responsibility to acknowledge and make visible the university's relationship to Native peoples. As members of the Berkeley community, it is vitally important that we not only recognize the history of the land on which we stand, but also we recognize that the Muek Maloney people are alive and flourishing members of the Berkeley and broader Bay Area communities today. As we begin this celebration, we would like to ask that you please remain in your seats for the ceremony, put your cell phones on silent, and also be aware of any signs and banners to where they are not blocking another audience member's view. We ask that all members of the audience allow other audience members to enjoy the program without disruption. Individuals involved in such behavior will be asked to leave the event and may be referred to the appropriate conduct offices. We ask that you keep all aisles clear for safety, and we thank you for your cooperation. Now, I'd like to personally welcome all of our students, faculty, staff, alums, parents, family members, and friends. As the Dean of Students, I have the pleasure of working with and being inspired by our amazing UC Berkeley students. Congratulations to each of you for your accomplishments. Yes, give it up for our class of 2023. They've been through so much, got through a little thing called COVID. Graduates, your presence on this campus whether virtually, remotely, or physically, has made us a better place. And your legacy will live on far past this day as you continue to be proud Cal alums. Now, please welcome our stage party, the Californians, class of 2023, the student award recipients, and our commencement performers led by Stephen Sutton, Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs.
And now, we have our distinguished faculty who will be led by Executive Vice Chancellor and Provost Ben Hermelin, who carries the Berkeley Mace. They will be followed by the academic procession and the official stage party. Now, please join me in welcoming someone who needs no introduction, who's the 11th Chancellor of the University of California, Berkeley, Carol T. Chris. Please welcome from the class of 2023, Leah Skurlock, who will sing the national anthem. Please rise if you were able and remove your hats. say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we held at the twilight's last gleaming Whose broad stripes and bright stars Through the perilous fight O'er the ramparts we watched Were so gallantly Yeah. <laughs> 
that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave or the And once again, our very own beloved Chancellor, Carol Christ. Let me begin by offering my heartfelt congratulations to you, this member, the members of this remarkable and resilient graduating class. Though the fates saw fit to place unprecedented challenges in your path, you kept your eyes on the prize, you have persevered, and you have prevailed. The successful completion of an undergraduate degree at Berkeley is challenging enough in the best of times. With that in mind, I can only marvel how you navigated that perilous and unexpected intersection between the start of your college careers at Berkeley and a global pandemic. Given all that you confronted and conquered, your presence here today is a testimony to a remarkable accomplishment whose meaning and worth will serve you well in the days to come. We could not be prouder. In so many ways, your resilience is a reflection of our campus as a whole. Ever since the pandemic's early days, we've seen a remarkable coming together of students, faculty, staff, and alumni in support of each other and our university. That resilience, those connections, that power of the campus community are the reasons why our university is emerging from these difficult days stronger than ever. And I believe the same will hold true for you. While this is a day to celebrate your achievement, there's no time like now to express gratitude to and for everyone who has helped you arrive at one of life's great milestones. So let us take a moment to celebrate and thank those who have supported and stood by you through thick and thin. Let us take this opportunity to express respect and appreciation for this university's extraordinary faculty and staff for, who have risen for you and together with you to meet and surmount unprecedented challenges and sustain Berkeley's character and quality. I knew it took a lot of hard work on your part to get here. I know the tolls these times have taken on you, your families, your friends, and the array of communities, large and small, that you belong to. Yet there's ample reason for hope. Behavioral and social science teaches us that unsettled times of change and transformation 
have the potential to facilitate personal and societal learning, growth, and adaptation. We're living in a historic moment when everything is shifting about us in ways that will have a profound impact on the future. This may be a perilous time, but so too is it a time of creative ferment and possibility. And that is prime time for this public university and for you, our newest alumni. What animates Berkeley is our belief in and commitment to individual and institutional agency, the notion that through the discovery, development, dissemination, and discussion of knowledge, we can make the world a better place. We have before us extraordinary opportunities to extract and apply valuable lessons from all they're witnessing and experiencing. These unprecedented times offer unprecedented opportunities for learning about ourselves, the communities and causes we draw strength, meaning, and support from, and about the role of the university in our lives, the nation, and the world. Now more than ever, the world needs all that you have to offer as the beneficiaries of a Berkeley education and experience, as change makers committed to advancing the greater good. Today, as you stand at one of life's great crossroads, take a deep breath, pause, reflect, and consider the road you've traveled and all that you can and will carry with you from Berkeley into your personal and professional lives. You've been taught how to learn by some of the world's greatest teachers. You value the truth and know how it must be protected. You believe in science. You know that conventional wisdom can and must always be challenged in order to find a better way. You know how to thrive, not just survive, amidst diversity of origins, identities, and perspectives. You emerge from a campus culture shaped by thousands of alumni who fought and fight for justice, equity, and inclusiveness. You're able to adapt and persevere in the face of challenge and hardship. Your generosity is a sure sign that you share the gratitude I feel for these attributes, values, and aspirations that form the foundation of all that Berkeley has to offer. Together, between last July and March, Berkeley students raised over $85,538. This golden gift, as it's known, will be shared with programs and departments across the campus. Thank you to all the students for keeping Cal golden. May your years ahead be richly rewarding and fulfilling and may you enjoy very much happiness. Hold tight to all the things you carry from Berkeley, and may they always serve you and the world around you well. We're immensely proud of what you've done and even more of what you will become. Fiat Lux and Go Bears! I would like now to introduce you to our very first two-term president, uh, ASUC president, a proud member of the class of 2023. Please join me in welcoming Shaka Talem.
No, I know where my family is. Hello, everyone. I hope you're doing well. Glad I didn't show up on Berkeley time. For those of you who I have not had the pleasure of meeting yet, my name is Shaka Talem. I'm a graduating fourth year student who studied political economy and minors in race and law and public policy. It's been my great honor and privilege to have served as our UC Berkeley student body president. Today marks a very pivotal moment in our lives. Some of us may be entering or re-entering the workforce, but we are all taking with us the knowledge and skills that we've gained over the years and putting them to the ultimate test. With the recent developments in our financial and tech sectors, many of us here today may view tomorrow with uncertainty. And the reality is, uncertainty is an inevitable aspect of life. However, as a class of 2023, our college experience has uniquely prepared us for it. We persevered through the unprecedented challenge of navigating college through a global pandemic. Even this academic year, we managed to navigate through being in the middle of the largest academic strike in US history. For us, uncertainty feels almost as familiar as a struggle to find housing in Berkeley. <laughs> While uncertainty might feel lonely and isolating, remember, we're never truly alone. Each diploma earned today is a representation of the collective sacrifices made not only by us as graduates whose names are written on the diploma, but also by those around us our loved ones who invested their time and energy to ensure our success. So let's take a moment to show our gratitude for their unwavering dedication. So I'd like to express my gratitude to my family and especially my mom, who's over there for helping me acclimate to life in Los Angeles. Moving from Texas to California felt like a bigger culture shock than the time I moved from Africa to the US. But her unwavering support made all the difference. Love you too. As you reflect on the sacrifices and support that brought you to this very moment, you might be reminded that amidst uncertainty, some doors may close. But always remember that the closure of one door may be what helps us find the trail down a far greater path. And me, standing here in front of you, is a great example of that. During my first semester here, I tried out for the mock trial team, hoping to pursue my dreams of becoming a lawyer. When I didn't make the cut, I was devastated. As someone who then and now still has aspirations of becoming an attorney, I felt like I had missed the one chance I had to best prepare for my career in the law. And experiencing that failure so early in college made me question if I really belonged here. Around that time, I started hearing about this thing called the ASUC, which I later found out was our student government. Initially, the idea of getting involved in government, to me, was not appealing. But in an attempt to bounce back from my mock trial rejection, I decided to give the ASUC a chance. And to my surprise, it quickly grew on me. Through the ASUC, I, was, I discovered a platform where I could use my voice to advocate for others, which was the very reason why I was attracted to mock trial in a career in the law. However, if I had let that rejection discourage me and succumbed to those feelings of defeat, I would have never joined the ASUC in the capacity that I had, let alone run for president. But because I moved from that rejection, I stand before you today as the first student body president in the history of UC Berkeley to be reelected and serve a second term.
So as we move forward into this next chapter of our lives, let us remember that success is not defined by the absence of failure, but by the ability to learn and move from it. Let us embrace uncertainty with the same resilience and determination that brought us to this very moment. And let us continue to strive towards our dreams, knowing that the doors we thought were closed may end up leading us to even greater opportunities. To the class of 2023 and the rest of our Golden Bear family, I look forward to the moments when I wear my cow quarter zip down the street and across I hear someone say, Go Bears! Thank you all so much for an amazing college experience. Go Bears and Fiat Lux. And now I'd like to introduce the 2023 winner of the Peter E. Haas Public Service Award which recognizes a Berkeley alum who has made significant voluntary contributions to the betterment of society within the United States. Here with us today is Reverend Dr. Clyde W. Oden, Jr., who graduated with four degrees from UC Berkeley. Dr. Oden arrived at Berkeley in the midst of the free speech movement, the civil rights movement, and other social unrest. Studying optometry and public health here, he learned the science and art of caring for individuals and helping entire communities. He then applied this knowledge and further education for the next 50 years in service as a healthcare executive, pastor, and community in South Los Angeles. And now please direct your attention to the video boards. My mother had lost her first child, who died at childbirth. When she was pregnant with me, she wanted that child to survive. She said to God, whatever you want him to do, he's yours. I now know that this calling on my life has been there all the time. And so my philosophy of life is serving others, caring for others. And in a sense, this is who I am. When I started at Cal, I was leaving a conservative San Diego. There's a time when the operation of the machine becomes so odious. I found myself witnessing the free speech movement, the civil rights movement, the anti-war movement, all of those things changed me. And by the time I left Berkeley, after finishing the School of Optometry and then finishing the School of Public Health, I was committed to serve a much larger agenda, and a much larger uh, challenge. Dr. Odin left Berkeley with four degrees three in optometry and one in public health, along with a lifelong commitment to help people in need. In 1969, he went to work for the Watts Health Center, which provides a range of medical and social services. He would rise to be their CEO, serving the South Los Angeles community as a healthcare leader for 33 years. We went from serving about 16,000 persons to serving over a quarter of a million people. In his early 40s, Dr. Odin had a profound spiritual experience that compelled him to join the ministry. This became his new calling for 25 years. As a pastor, Odin learned new ways to serve the needs of his congregation and the community. We had health care services. Uh, we had training programs. We had health education activities going on. We had meetings for persons dealing with substance abuse problems. We worked with uh, the homeless uh, communities. So I found that as a pastor, I was able to integrate both uh, what I had learned at Berkeley, what I had done professionally as a healthcare executive, and what I had learned in seminary in terms of blending all these things together to address the needs of the communities that we were serving. Berkeley was a launching pad for me 
to see the world from a different perspective, a wonderful perspective. And I could see great possibilities, unlimited possibilities, because of what happened here at Cal. Please join me in welcoming Reverend Dr. Clyde W. Oden, Jr. To Chancellor Chris, to ASUC President Tillman, to Dean Flanagan and Dean Liu, to the faculty and to the staff, to our speaker Steve Wozniak, to the students of UC, and to the graduates, the class of 2023, congratulations. I thank the family of Peter E. Haas for, and the awards committee for your generosity and commitment to promoting social change. I give honor to God for God's grace and mercy to allow me to experience this moment. I thank my family, beginning with my ancestors, including my parents, my wife, Barbara Lee, my two brothers, my three children, and grandchildren, and nieces, and nephews, some of whom are right here, right now. And finally, I thank the UC Berkeley family, the institution that shaped me into the person I am today. From the Wertheim School of Optometry and Vision Science to the School of Public Health, they were the foundation for my intellectual development. They taught me the value of health as a human right and health care as a community affair. Additionally, I credit the student activists who were on Sproul Plaza and the activists in the streets of Berkeley and the Bay Area. They were important to my evolution as a person. My coming of age happened here. I left Berkeley with a feeling of what South Africans call Ubuntu. I am because we are. And as a result, I spent 33 years in Watts, bringing health care to the underserved, 24 years laboring in the pulpits of the African Methodist Episcopal Church, bringing the good news of the gospel. And now I am serving Californians through AC Care Alliance, an organization that brings resources and assistance to persons and their caregivers who are living with advanced illnesses, Ubuntu. I have one thing I want to share with everyone. The golden rule is as important today as it was first revealed nearly 2,000 years ago. Do unto others as you would have them to do unto you. We must look out for our brothers and sisters, especially those less fortunate than ourselves. I am because we are. It's not about me, it's about the we. Thank you for this honor. My challenge to all of you is to strive to make this world a better place. Go and serve humanity. Peace and blessings. Go Bears. It gives me great pleasure to acknowledge awards to some of our many outstanding graduates. Please rise when I call your name. The Jake Gimble Prize is awarded to Max 
Schumacher of Rubbery. The Anna Espenshade Prize goes to Aveline Lucha Shipholt of Women's Basketball. The highest honor the university can give to a student is the University Medal. The following students are the University Medal finalists. Please come forward for your certificates. The university medalist finalists are Aaron Hill, <laughs> Rohit Saji, Andreas Sandoval. and Rosie Ward. Now let's give them a warm round of applause. It now gives me great pleasure to present the University Medal to the most distinguished graduating senior on the Berkeley campus Catherine or Katie Neves Vera. Katie truly embodies the excellence of this graduating class with personal dedication to human rights, activities, honor societies, journals, and more, all while maintaining a 4.0 GPA with a major in cognitive science and minors in both data science and human rights. Now, I ask that you please direct your attention to the video boards to learn more about all that she's accomplished while here at Cal. When I was three years old, I first learned the mechanics of basic ballet steps, and I really kept pursuing ballet until I began college. When I was 14 years old, I discovered that a mass was growing in my stomach, and it was a malignant cancerous tumor. I had multiple surgeries. It was an arduous process of at least five years, but it also meant the loss of this dream I had to pursue ballet full time. A month into my first semester at Berkeley, my dad was diagnosed with ALS, or Lou Gehrig's disease, and I had to take on this, this new position as his caregiver. The COVID pandemic hit right about when I was considering withdrawing. I was able to go home and continue caring for my dad so let's talk about what we learned. I decided to take a class called Refugee Itineraries and Identities, which ultimately changed the trajectory of my professional career. Katie is one of what I would call a Blue Moon student. They're one of this rare handful of students who you know will go on to do extraordinary things. Is she had a project about judges' decision making in asylum cases. After she and her colleagues submitted this as a paper to a major competition, they walked away with the best paper award. Who knows what my life would have been like as a professional ballet dancer. But I know that ballet will always be a part of me, even as I begin my journey in law. Catherine Nieves Vera, it's my honor to present you with the University Messel. Congratulations. I now invite Katie to share a few words with us. Hello, fellow graduates, distinguished faculty, 
and esteemed guests. It is an honor to speak with you today. My name is Katie Vera, and I am beyond grateful to be the class of 2023's university medalist. What an impactful four years we've had. Think back with me to fall 2019, when we were first settling into our dorm rooms and becoming acquainted with our new campus. We felt excited, nervous, joyful, and quite a bit overwhelmed. In an attempt to fit into our new identities as Berkeley students, we sought out to learn as much Berkeley lore as possible. In a matter of weeks, we were proudly scurrying around the university seals embedded in the pavement, blasting through hordes of flyering students on Sproul, and trying to find that darned room in Dwinnell. But just when we'd found our footing, our world was upended and new fears emerged. We scattered across the globe and struggled to zoom in to our classes amid not just a global pandemic, but also wildfires, power outages, an orange sky, a turbulent political climate, and a national racial reckoning. As the COVID era dragged on, we spent our days muted behind computer screens, mechanically typing into those chat boxes, and mastering the art of sharing our screen. Although, that screen sharing still seems to be a highly complicated task for some of our beloved professors. More than any other class, the class of 2023 has borne the full brunt of the pandemic during our college years. In the face of this ordeal, we maintained a vibrant sense of camaraderie through our shared Berkeley spirit. We recreated our campus in the, vir in the virtual world. We were forced to adapt, to innovate, and to advocate for ourselves and others. Crucially, we had to be resilient. Resilience is the ability to adapt in the face of adversity. It is the quality that helps us bounce back from our setbacks, learn from our experiences, ask for help and receive it from others, and grow stronger as individuals. Today, I'd like to talk a little bit about resilience. As your peer, I don't feel qualified to engage in that time-honored commencement tradition of giving advice or sharing words of wisdom. So instead, I will simply offer a few reflections from my own personal experience to the extent that they might resonate with you. I wouldn't be here today without the help I received from so many people along the way. From a young age, I was an aspiring professional ballet dancer and had never even conceived of going to college. By age 14, I had left home to train full time at a ballet conservatory. But just when the grueling years of training were beginning to pay off, I was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. The disease was painful, as was the loss of the dream I had worked all of my life to achieve. I felt lost, but I mustered up the courage to reach out to my community for help, and they flooded me with support. In time, the scars, both physical and emotional, began to heal. Ultimately, I sought out a new and previously unimaginable path. I applied to college, and I am so grateful that Berkeley took a chance on me. At Berkeley, I found a beautiful, vibrant, and at times daunting world that ignited my intellectual curiosity, introduced me to brilliant professors and lifelong friends, and fostered my love of learning. But before long, my life ran headlong into another adversity. My dad was diagnosed with ALS. The illness I had once known distantly as Stephen Hawking's disease became my everyday reality. For months on end, I watched helplessly as the disease paralyzed his body, then stole his ability to speak, and then to breathe. He died just before classes were to resume in person. It pains me greatly that he is not alive to see all of us graduate today, 
but I know that he would have been so proud of the people we have become. After these two tragedies, I felt all the more grateful to be back on the Berkeley campus, where I could once again explore life's biggest questions. My cognitive science classes helped me understand the neurological mechanisms underlying these diseases. My philosophy and humanities classes helped me unpack the meaning of life and death. And my human rights coursework exposed me to today's biggest problems, human suffering, present day atrocities, and war crimes. This coursework felt so impactful, and I was hooked. I fell in love with my research at the Human Rights Center, where, under the phenomenal leadership of Dr. Alexa Koenig, my path in life was re-choreographed once more. Now, looking back, I realize that learning about the suffering of others gives us clarity about the adversity we may have encountered in our own lives. I suspect that many of us have encountered grief in the last four years, whether it be the loss of a loved one, or of a relationship, or a friendship. The fact that we are still here today and graduating from one of the world's best universities, no less, proves that we have all within us the strength and resilience we need to carry on. Berkeley has enabled us to learn so much about our world, whether we chose to study it through science, politics, technology, or literature. Berkeley graduates are resourceful, dedicated, and empathetic with our fellow human beings, even though our lives may be worlds apart. Berkeley certainly didn't give us all of the answers, but has, it has inspired in us a lifelong love of learning, and this will serve us well. As Berkeley graduates, we have the tools and the education to be agents of change in the world. The challenges confronting our generation are immense. As we move forward to meet them, let's do so with a sense of urgency, empathy, and most of all, resilience so that we may continue to persevere in the face of challenges ahead. Congratulations, graduates of the class of 2023. We've made it and go Bears. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Lindy Byrne. I'm a molecular environmental biology major and I'm your senior class president. And my name is Mari Wong. I am a political science and conservation and resource studies double major. And I am your senior class vice president. I am so honored to be addressing you today, truly, some of the best and brightest graduates in the world. At Berkeley, we're big picture people. It's what walking by Nobel laureate parking spaces every day does to you. There is a pride instilled in you when you get to say you are graduating from the number one public university in the nation. <clears throat> But the hardest question always seems to be, what's next? Before we've even closed this chapter, we are asked, what comes after Berkeley? My parents are here, and they don't know what I'm about to say, but I wanted to share their love story with you. Both sides of my family are from Hong Kong. My mother immigrated to Alameda 40 years ago, her family of seven made their livelihood by opening their own authentic Chinese restaurant they called China Queen, which just so happened to be on Telegraph Avenue. For years, my mom and her siblings would work every day, selling food to Berkeley students and handing out flyers on Sproul Plaza. My dad's family is also from Hong Kong. 
but my dad was a Berkeley student. Eeks, class of 89. My dad loved Berkeley, but when he was homesick, he looked for a little piece of home in authentic Hong Kong cuisine. And he found himself at China Queen. There, he met the love of his life, my mom, a waitress, at my family's restaurant. It was that small action that defined not just his time at Berkeley, but the rest of their lives and my life as well. The big picture isn't possible without these little moments. So, to my big picture people, I encourage you to treasure the moments you don't notice. Whether it's the endless hours at main stacks, picnicking on the Glade, or your favorite Chinese restaurant on Telegraph, they are all forever part of your unforgettable, incredible, and unique Berkeley story. It's what made Berkeley home. Keep chasing your big picture dreams, but inevitably, when the uncertainty of the future seems daunting, whether it's in 15 years or tomorrow morning, when you're looking for a little piece of home, look for Berkeley. Look for Berkeley in the love you found, in the friends you made, in the person you have become. As our class now goes across the world for our next new adventure, remember this one is not over. My parents' Berkeley story didn't end when they moved away from this city. Their story continues here today, 30 years later, with their daughter on this stage. Today, their Berkeley story continues, and so does ours. Thank you. A few weeks ago, at the ripe old age of 21, I called my dad as I was having what I deemed my quarter life crisis. I was hoping he could sprinkle a little wisdom and knowledge on me. I began by explaining to him that I was feeling sad about leaving school and scared to miss my friends and the life I had created here. The first thing he said to me was, what a privilege it is to have something to miss. So as we sit here today, ready to make the long-awaited jump into our next phase of life, I hope we can each think about the privilege we have had these last few years. The privilege to continue our education under some of the most brilliant professors and teachers in the world. The privilege to be surrounded by peers that have pushed us to be the best versions of ourselves. And finally, the privilege to be surrounded by friends, family, and mentors who have made a permanent impact on our lives by supporting us along this wild journey we call college. While earning a degree at this school is undoubtedly an incredible solo accomplishment, I know for a fact that I wouldn't be here today without the support of so many people. So I propose a challenge to each of my fellow graduates of the class of 2023. Firstly, to not only recognize the immense determination and willpower within yourself that it has taken to achieve our goals here today, but also to say thank you to someone who has helped you reach this ceremony. One of the greatest life lessons I have learned in my past four years here is to recognize and show gratitude to the people who have helped us in times of need. On that note, there are a few more promises I want us to make to one another today. Promise to try to find passion and pride in the work we are doing. Promise to enjoy life and have some good old fashioned fun once in a while. And lastly, promise to always take pride in our Cal family. Although we leave Memorial Stadium today for the last time as Cal students, we take with us the impact that this university has had on us through such a formative time in our lives. As a campus community, we have pioneered through a lot together. I take pride in being part of the class of 2023, and I can confidently stand here and say, I will forever bleed our cow blue and gold. Finally, 
It has been my privilege to serve you as class president, and it is my honor today to introduce another member of our Bear family who continues to represent our school proudly. A Silicon Valley icon, technology entrepreneur, and philanthropist for more than 40 years, our keynote speaker has helped shape the computing industry with his design of Apple's first line of products, the Apple One and Two. He and Steve Jobs founded Apple Computers Incorporated with his Apple One personal computer, and in 1981, he came back to UC Berkeley and finished his degree in electrical engineering and computer science. I think I speak for almost every graduate sitting here today when I say that without the work done by our keynote speaker, we would not be able to have completed our time at Cal. We literally carry the work done by this Berkeley alum every day. And to me, Apple is a reminder of the endless capabilities that each and every one of our Berkeley grads have. I cannot wait to see the work I know we will all contribute to this changing world. To date, he has received 10 honorary Doctor of Engineering degrees. For his achievements at Apple, he was awarded the National Medal of Technology by President Ronald Reagan in 1895, the highest honor bestowed on America's leading innovators. Through the years, he has been involved in various business and philanthropic ventures, focusing primarily on computer capabilities in schools and stressing hands-on experimental learning that encourages creativity and innovation by students. To all my iPad kids out there, this one's for you. From our very own class of 1986, Steve Wozniak. Okay, it's working. I have always honored the younger over the older in my life. Um, anyway, I was told today to be brief and funny, so under my robe, I'm wearing my briefs. Thanks. I'm, I'm often asked what my proudest moment was in my life. And I answer, it's my graduation from Cal. And we say, my school, right or wrong? My team, right or wrong? And then she will say, Our, my country, right or wrong? But we really should question such things and not just accept them. We should always challenge to be better. Um, there was a time when um, my, I had two of my kids at the University of Colorado and it got into the Pac-8 and we watched Berkeley demolish their basketball team and then we went to a game at Stanford Stanford versus Colorado, and Janet and I, they spotted us. They spotted us, and they put us in the front row of the arena, in the athletic director's box, the front row, and we're dressed in Berkeley colors, rooting for Colorado at Stanford. <laughs> Graduation represents a huge stream of effort you put into tests and studying and courses, and it represents your brain. So my graduation here represented that. But now I also have a proudest moment that comes from the heart. I got to walk my daughter down the aisle. I had wanted to for so long, and wanting is even more important than knowledge sometimes. Corey Hall, I guess there's a lot of people named Hall that went here. Corey Hall taught me a lot about computers. Tolman Hall taught me a lot about people. Norton Hall, the dorm. 110 Norton Hall taught me how you could do unusual things and be an outsider and still have a lot of fun and, and progress. Um, and you know, this school is well acknowledged for engineering. I'm proud of that. My wife went to a small school in Kansas whose reputation is addicting substances. The founder of Panda Express went there to the same school, and that's addicting. 
So I grew up outside the normal people, outside the normal socialization in school, you know. But I was very lucky to be a good student, to have a brain. And it assured me of a life ahead, you know, just be, despite being too shy to even talk to people, scared to talk to them. I couldn't speak their speak. And shyness lets you do a lot of things on your own. Um, it helped me think different. It helped me think outside of the box. I didn't have to be doing the same things as other people since I didn't interact with them, too scared of conflict. And other people in our school might say, what's his problem? And another might answer, well, he's an electronic genius. So, whew, I had that going for me. And, you know, I, I even went down to the library in Sunnyvale and read books on psychology to figure out what I was, uh, what I had that was wrong. And, no, it turned out I was just fine. I just daydream a lot. That's the closest I have to any psychology thing. And uh, my night dreams, I'd go to sleep at night in those days, and even college days, thinking about a deep problem in school, in mathematics maybe, in computers. And I'd come up with the answers sometimes at midnight, wake up in the middle, dreaming the answers. Um, when college time came, of course, I had excellent grades, and I'd won my school math awards, and I had 800 SAT and scores in math and sciences, and I had taught myself to design computers when it was impossible. There were no books, no classes, no computers around, and I just stumbled into little bits of information. It was my life's goal. Um, so I was totally self-taught, and being self-taught about things, when you discover something, you get interested, you go teach yourself, and it's not for a class, it's not to be graded with everyone else, that's where you learn it the best. Where to apply? And Cal was logical, I was a shoe-in for, for Cal and UC, and it was logical and it was easy and it was efficient. But, and, and not only that, a movie came out my last year of high school, The Graduate, and Cal had a role in it. I would drive by the campus and think about wanting it. But my first flight, ever outside of California was with a couple of friends to Colorado and it snowed that day. I had never seen snow in my life. Oh my gosh, tromping around in it. CU Boulder was the only school I would apply to and my parents said okay, you know, that I could follow my heart and I've taken that into account ever since. Um, I was glad for the parents that did that. Um, my parents did say they only had money for one year of expensive out-of-state tuition that Colorado has. So one year was all I would get. And the Introduction to Computers course was a graduate course. But I was allowed to take it because I was in engineering as a freshman. And I got an A+. And I wrote all these programs that were so good that scientists and, and engineers wanted to use, useful courses. And I didn't realize it, I ran our class five times over some budget. Uh-oh, I thought you were in class and you could write all the programs you wanted. They should have praised my intellect, but instead they accused me of wrongdoing. That happened in other occasions in my life when I was doing some great things. Um, that year, of course, you want to have fun. You don't want to be only productive going to classes. Oh my gosh, I knew electronics. I'd been a ham radio operator since 10 years old. I knew how to build transmitters. <coughs> so I built a TV jammer and I turned it on and I could blacken every TV in our dorm. And, and then there was one color TV on campus. It was over in the basement of a girl's dorm and I'd go over there and turn up my jammer and it didn't blacken the TV, it fuzzed it up and a friend of mine would whack the TV and, after, and it would go good, I'd make it go good. And then a little later it'd go bad and he'd whack it harder and harder. And it got to where for weeks they stationed one student in a, in a chair next to the TV with the job to fix it by tuning controls and everything. And I started playing with their body positions. Got them to stand on a chair, got them to, uh, um, got them to hold a hand in the middle of the TV to watch the mass, ma last half of a Mission Impossible. It, you know, it came time thinking about what am I gonna be in life? You know, many of you are here now and I said, I want to be good and I want to be liked. But I was, you know, unable to talk to people. But I, I decided that honesty was the most important thing. You're honest. If you're even doing something bad, you'll at least be honest with it, with your, um, you know, those that are close to you. So when I was at Berkeley, building little devices and made free phone calls, I told my parents and all, they said, they said, just don't do it in our house. So I did it in the dorm. And I came up with formulas thinking, 
What's important? I read a book about a guy that was buying and selling half billion dollar companies in today's dollars. Sumner Redstone was his name. And I thought, would I want to be that person with that much power? And I said, and I laughed about the TV jammer, and I said, no, I'd rather be the guy that goes to my death just laughing and smiling. I want to be that. And I said, life is not about accomplishment, it's about happiness. And my formula for happiness, thank you. Because this was the best thing I ever did in my life, much more important than Apple. But my formula was happiness is feelings, smilings and laughter minus frowns and being upset at things. So, of course, I found ways to have a lot of laughter. I, I loved music. It was magic drops of love in the air to me, you know. And a lot of the lyrics, you know, were guides to my own personal philosophy in life. I would say, um, you know, like, for example, how you avoid frowns. First of all, I'd say don't argue. You might not agree with somebody, but you have a good brain, and they have a brain that comes to their answers. And... So, but I didn't want to be judgmental. I didn't want to have to take sides against people and have conflict. And uh, I would look to, like, in a song, it said, you know, there ain't, there ain't no good guy, there ain't no bad guy, there's only you and me, and we just disagree. You can apply that to a lot of things in life. Yeah, you don't have to make everything a, an argument and have enemies and all. So I became non-political. Vietnam War played a part in that. I don't have time to get into uh, how, what influenced me then. But um, politics, I couldn't believe that I could ever vote for anyone, and it would really change my life. How good of a home do I have? So I would never vote, and I never voted in my life for president until the last election I did. And I didn't, I didn't have any direct religion in my life. Of course, I explored it in early college years. Explored religion, but uh, I decided religion was about being a good person. And my God, I knew I had a brain. I could make myself a good person. So my God is a little part of my brain. And uh, I you know, came up with a lot of things that sound like religion, like if somebody's bad to me, I'm good to them. That's an important concept in life. And you know, how do you be good? You know, first of all, don't force your values on other people, even your own children. Let them grow up like I did, free to meet their friends and choose their ways in life and their own values. My, my daughter, Sarah, was, um, her college decision came. She was an A, an A plus student all the way, national athlete. Schools from across the country sent recruiters to recruit her to our house. And she was accepted by Ivy League schools at the top of her list. And then athletic schools like Florida. And then University of Colorado, because I spoke of it highly. And then Northern California schools, including Cal. And the bottom of her list, Southern California schools, UCLA and USC. UCLA is a sister school. It's not a rival like Stanford. And anyway, I, I just told her. I said, I was so glad about her, her great college acceptances. And I told her I was a little surprised the Southern California schools were at the bottom of her list because college is the most fun four years of your life. And you want to be among people you'll have fun with, people with similar personalities. And I told Sarah that she had a Southern California personality. So I was just surprised it was the bottom of her list. I didn't try to influence her. A week later, she chose UCLA, and it was the right decision forever for her. But, but she definitely is a fan of Cal. Yay, go Bears. Um, go Oski. So I, I built a cream soda computer, I called it, in 1970, five years before Apple would start. And around the time Apple started, a bunch of other people were trying to build little small affordable pieces of equipment called, they called computers that were the same thing I built five years before. No, I wanted them to become much more human. And, um, and then I met Steve Jobs around that time. And Steve Jobs valued my technical knowledge and abilities. You know, a lot of that coming from Berkeley. And uh, anybody who appreciated me and understood me was my best friend forever because I had no way to make friends, really. So we became great friends. And um, I took, you know, the day I met Steve Jobs, you know, and he's thinking about where we go in life. I took him to my home. I sh and he was 16 years old and didn't have any albums. He didn't have any money. And I showed him the Bob Dylan albums. 
I showed him strange interviews and liner notes, the lyrics to unbelievable songs. So it became a big part of our lives. Dylan Music, Seeking Memorabilia. What were those songs talking about to a person looking for a life? One time there was a computer introduced, the Nova 4K computer, and I told my dad I would own a 4K Nova computer someday. I was young, but I had posters in my, in my bedroom in high school of computers. And uh, there, there were no computers back then. My dad said that a Nova 4K would cost as much as a house. Uh, I said, I'll live in an apartment. I threw down the gauntlet. Forever, you put some things deep in your soul that you say, I want to do a certain thing someday. I want to be a certain thing. And it just stays with you for life. It just doesn't go away. Um, so it was in my heart and stayed there. Now, my third college year was at Cal. And I just took, oh my gosh, I just took grad level courses in, in hardware and software design. And there was a girl writing a paper for a psych class, and she wanted an unusual person, an abnormal person. So I got to talk to a girl about a report she was doing. First girl I ever talked to gave me a chance at a normal life, one of my strongest Berkeley memories. I, you know, I grew up loving typing. We would type, you know, a lot of uh, uh, girls in high school wanted to be uh, typing secretaries someday, it was called, when I was in high school, and I was faster in typing too than all the girls. But you know, I learned to type so fast for computers terminals. And at Cal, I would actually meet other people. I, I didn't know them. They don't know me. They don't know my name. To this day, they wouldn't know it was I. But I would type a term paper for them, just loving the typing from midnight until 6 a.m. Cursive written notes, retyping them, taking in class, retyping them into a term paper. And I would charge five cents. Five cents was much better. If I did it, if I did it for free, it would just be for a friend. But I didn't know these people. I just uh, enjoyed doing it. Um, and that's you know, so some things you can do because you enjoy it, and you don't have to have money for it. Um, I got a job early on after three years of college with no college degree at Hewlett Packard, designing the hottest extreme products of the world at the time. Some handheld scientific calculators for engineers and physicists. And I determined that at that company, it was such great values, I would be an engineer for life at Hewlett Packard, never move up the org chart because it gets a little political like. And one time a, a cl club started, and uh, it was called the Homebrew Computer Club. And there were many from Berkeley and from Stanford professors speaking about the life change we'd have once we had our own computers, our own computing devices, how much more a, a human can do with technology. And um, I designed the first, uh, my first computer, a great computer. You could type on a keyboard with a video display. Every computer before it had ugly buttons and switches and lights and everything. Nothing any worse near human. This was like a typewriter. It was so far ahead of what anyone else was doing. But people were looking over my shoulder. I gave it away. I gave it away for free, open source, public domain, no copyright notices, and other people in this club built my computer. And, and the keyboard TV approach changed the world. Now, Steve Jobs came into town. About once a year he'd come into town, and whatever I had invented lately, he'd turn it into money. And, and, I, and there's a movie with Ashton Kutcher as Steve Jobs come finding me in a basement with a computer and taking me down to a club. Steve had never been to the club. He didn't know I'd built the computer. I'd been to the club every day since it started. So there's a little, things get changed in life from the truth. And I brought him to the club to see the excitement. And that's when he said we should start a company. And of course, I wanted to be an engineer for life at Hewlett Packard. I wouldn't risk my job. So I proposed the personal computer to Hewlett Packard and they turned me down for the first of five times. All the big computer companies said this was gonna be nothing. Yeah, so Steve and I started a company and we had a goal. We wanted to help the disabled. We thought technology could help the disabled, that someday blind people and sighted people could be more equal. And look how much we've succeeded. Everywhere you go, just look at the sidewalk. People are walking around looking at their, as blind as could be. <laughs> Anyway, my goal, I gotta admit this, was not to start an industry. It was not to start a company. It was so that other engineers with minds like those from Berkeley could look over my shoulder and see what I had created and respect me as an engineer and say, whoa, how did he think of those things? 
just sometimes magic pours out of your head. Well, turns out that a computer I built was going to be all of the profits of Apple, the only profitable product for the first 10 years of the company. What made Apple? And it was, um, you know, Apple's now larger than the GDP of Great Britain and almost any stock exchange. And it was my Apple II computer that did that. The games were always important. Pong taught me a TV can be an output device. And I also designed a game called Breakout for Atari, lots of other games. And um, I was, what I was doing was I was designing a lot of, I got a reputation. An engineer, young engineer, Hewlett Packard, designing products for people around California mainly, like the first hotel movie systems and other um, you know, TV encoding algorithms. And I got this reputation. I always charged five cents. So, and I would do incredible, incredible um, digital designs. But um, I had built an, a terminal. I wanted to be part of the interesting things in the world. The ARPANET had been created. Six universities in the United States. Okay, six universities. Now it's the internet with billions of connections. And I had a job, but I was young. I had a lot of time for my own things. So I built a terminal that could call the ARPANET. Had to be a part of it. Anyway, um, fortunately, I came up with a, an idea for color. I was down to Atari and I said, wouldn't these games be beautiful if they were in color? Because they were black and white. And I, I was a television engineer too, and I knew how to design color with di differential calculus and high level math. And no, I thought of an idea to do it with digital, with a number from a computer that a TV would think was color, even though it violated everything in any book. And that was for free, and that's what um, gave us a six-color logo for Apple when we started the company. Nobody else was going to be able to do that. Anyway, I went back to Berkeley after a plane crash. I was working. Yes. Yes, a plane crash. Ten years later, I called up Steve Jobs and said, this is my last chance to get my college degree, my last year. And I wanted my kids that I would have someday to know you know, I went to a college and I graduated from it. And the name on my Berkeley diploma is the name I used here, because my name was famous by then, Rocky Raccoon Clark. That's on my diploma. So anyway, but I came back as a psych major. I wanted to study the brain. I wanted to study um, you know, memories and things like that, and, uh, and unusual thinkings. I came up with a stronger statement than in any book about where a memory might be. How do you read a memory in a person's brain? We don't know. Go in, analyze some synapses, and say, oh, that's the word corn. Not, not going not gonna to be. No, nothing said where a memory was in the brain, that it was in the brain even. And I came up with an observation. You lose two things between the ages of 6 and 10, your childhood, autobiographic memories, and your teeth. You know, there's this idea. Could we make a brain if we don't know, really know how it's wired? Could we make a brain like an engineer? And I was at a company where the engineers figured out how to make a brain. It takes nine months. I got into experimental research, very heavy in mathematics. Inferential statistics makes no sense to people who think they know normal statistics, descriptive statistics. And I got in there, and I was tutoring a student for five cents a session, but she needed simplified mathematics. So I looked at it and worked on the formulas that were not understandable by any human, and I came up with a totally different one from the books. And it was poetic, and understandable, and instructive, and that the critical number that said, did your experiment work or not, the critical variable I came up with could be if you took each of the groups by age and gender and ethnicity differentials, took each of them, got, got a standard deviation and a, and a mean for each one on your calculator, you could take the critical variable was the standard deviation of the means divided by the mean of the standard deviations. So poetic and understandable. You still had to multiply by the square root of n. Anyway, always have fun with numbers. I'm just giving one example. You can always have fun with numbers. For example, um, my age is 72. I like to tell people it's a palindrome. 72 is the same backwards and forwards. You're saying, what? In mathematics, mathematically, 72, 3 times 8 times 3. Backwards and forwards, the same. 3 times 8 times Or more poetically, 2 times 3 times 2 times 3 times 2. It's also 2 to the 3rd times 3 to the 2nd. I don't know what I'm going to do when I have a birthday now.
Always look for ways to make life fun. Be inspired. Use your brains. Think for yourselves. Be leaders, not followers, doing everything everyone else is doing in a crowd. Inspire others yourself. Know that you are good for the world. Know who you are, and don't let that be changed even by success in your life. Strive for excellence. Try to be the best in the world. That's a good, good thing for Cal. Be gracious whether you win or lose. Life is not a dress rehearsal. You are living it. It's not a dress rehearsal. Help others that are younger. Help others that are less experienced. Be mentors, be teachers. Someday, you may find you have no energy left to keep on giving. You can be thankful that you used everything you were given for this life. As you depart today, realize that time only moves in one direction. Steve, thank you for changing so many of our lives. I remember using my first Apple computer in college 30 years ago, and I've never looked back. I never go anywhere without my iPhone. So thank you for the difference you've made in, in the world. And now I ask that all candidates for degrees please rise as you're able for the conferring of the degrees by Chancellor T. Chris. Graduates, please rise as you're able. By virtue of the authority vested in me by the President of the University of California, I grant you the degrees of Doctor of Philosophy, Master of Arts, Master of Science, Bachelor of Arts, and Bachelor of Science. Congratulations, graduates. You may now move your tassels from the right to the left side. Please stand as the UC Men's Octet lead us in Hail to California, the university's alma mater.
Thank you again for attending the class of 2023 commencement ceremony. Congratulations to our phenomenal graduates and their families. Graduates, please recess up to the top of the stadium to meet your families down by Memorial Glade. And remember to drop off your empty water bottles in the recycling bins on your way out. Guests, please remain in your seats until the recessional has been completed and join your graduates near the Campanile and Memorial Glade. We wish you all a pleasant and safe afternoon. Again, congratulations and forever, go 